Before Jeff Lynn's ELO. Before Electric Light Orchestra Part 2. Before the Traveling Wilburys. Before the Electric Light Orchestra. Before the Move, the Idle Race, and the Night Riders. There were... The Chads. Face the Music, an Electric Light Orchestra song-by-song podcast, returns on September 24th as Face the Music, a pre-ELO song-by-song podcast, covering the groups that evolved into the Electric Light Orchestra. And we start with the 1965 EP by The Chads, the first record Jeff Lynne appeared on. But you can only hear it when you subscribe to the podcast at patreon.com slash ELO pod for $4 a month. Hello and welcome to Pods Like Us, and I'm going to start this again because somebody's got the wrong page. He's got the, <laughs> the notes for the next show at half past 11. Yes, yes. I'm here to talk about daffodils. <laughs> yeah. I'm here to talk about um, entrepreneurs and <laughs> starting your own business. That's it, yes. For black women. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. My speciality. <laughs> yeah, transsexuals <laughs> no politics remember <laughs> no that's true <laughs> hello and welcome to pods like us i'm martin quibble known to my friends as marv and this time i'm speaking with paul stevenson from vintage rock pod hey paul thanks for being here thank you for inviting me on your show it says a pleasure to be here I've been really looking forward to this. And as an aside, I'll just say one of the great things recently is that you've made an alteration to, well, an addition to -hmm. the show where you had incredible interviews weekly, as it was anyway before, uh, with some incredible guests such as, you know, John Lodge, Jim, I'm trying to pronounce his name now, Peterick from um, Survivor. Thank you, from Survivor, who were both remember from back in the day when we used to buy their singles um and people and other people as well some incredible people uh bruce foxton as well i think you had once didn't you from the jam yes yes that's from it the jam. Yep. yep 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 and um uh, big plug there because he did a fantastic episode that talked about uh the song start by the jam the <laughs> yes, other day that was as it, well yep. <laughs> but that's what i'm hinting at this day rocks that is incredible that you've added that so that each day you'll have like a five minute episode that explains like celebrity birthdays on that day. And then you pick a specific event that's happened on that day or, or related to that day and go into detail about it. And I think that's fantastic. It's, it's adding to, there's a lot of shows like that where you've got this like shorter, really bite size quick in and out five minutes that gives you what you need to know about a subject. Yes. Um, And there's a lot of those. And I think it's incredible that you've added that to the, to the interviews. And then every day outside of that, you have this. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for that. It's very kind words indeed. Um, As you said there, I mean, I've done 71 big interviews to date, 16 rock and roll hall of famers. I mean, we're talking some huge names on the likes of Dire Straits and Genesis and Rainbow and Deep Purple and all these sorts of bands, you know, some big bands. And I was sitting on all this information because once you've recorded them and once you've released it and I've chopped little bits up for YouTube and the interview's already there, I was thinking, I've got all this fantastic audio. What can I do with it? So what came to me was, why don't I start releasing shorter snippets so on youtube i began a thing called um rock stories so there are just three or four minutes short little videos on youtube that you can go in dive in enjoy watch to your heart's content and i thought well why can't i do something with the with a podcast because at the moment the audio is there you can sit and listen to the 30 minutes 40 minutes whatever it is but that's it and then i thought why don't i come up with something where i can use this again it's like recycling stuff but in a a fun way and something different so that's where this day rocks came from And, and like you said it can be talking about a single that's at number one an album that has just gone platinum a, a big festival that happened somebody was born on that day it's a a, a a story from that day so today could be i don't know the 7th of july and on that day so and so scored his first number one here's the guy talking about it 
So I just thought it was a nice way of throwing out some more rock content for my listeners. Uh, it's nice and easy to consume. Like you said, you can listen to it in the morning when you're brushing your teeth, while you're having your coffee, while you're driving to work, while you're on your, your ciggy break, if you're having a fag at work sort of thing. You can just consume it nice and easily, and it's not going to take up as much of your day as a full interview show would. So that was kind of the premise behind this one. But the other good thing about that is, though, when you're using those those snippets from the archive, so to speak, yep. you are then self-promoting in a way as well, because then you'll say to people at the end, I like this bit where you'll say, if you want to listen to the whole interview, it's episode blah, blah, blah. Yeah. So if people want to do that, I mean, that's how you grab me with, I want to go back and listen to the Jim Peterick episode now oh, in course, total. Yeah, yeah. Because while he was talk while he was talking about the the song "Eye of the Tiger" uh, from 1982, I was listening. I was thinking, "Oh, I need to listen to that interview because I want to hear if he says anything about Burning Heart from Rocky IV." Yep. And um, small spoiler, he does, but he also has some fantastic stories as well because he had a, a huge hit single when he was just a teenager. He talks about touring with Led Zeppelin when he was 19 or something like that. So there's stories like that. I mean, the, the name Survivor came from the fact that he was in a band that crashed, the aeroplane that they were on crashed, and he missed that flight. He wasn't available to go to that gig that day. The band took off and the crane, the plane crashed, and that's where the name Survivor came from. So, yeah, lots of interesting snippets on Jim Petrick's episode. Definitely do go back and check that one out. Absolutely. So here's an interesting start then. Do you remember what the first record was that you bought? Do you know what? I was thinking about this earlier and I, I honestly can't remember. Um, I lived in Germany when I was younger. My dad was in the army. Um, so we moved around as the forces sort of thing. So I'd, I'd never really had that whole record store experience of going when I was younger. I kind of listened to what my dad was listening to. So a lot of Queen, he was a big fan of Queen and Black Sabbath and Fleetwood Mac and things like that. So I can't actually remember the first one I bought myself. It had probably been a 90s thing because I, I know you're going to ask me about concerts as well. So I didn't come back to the UK until um, kind of the early mid 90s. So it would have been some sort of indie thing at that, at that stage, I'm thinking. I couldn't tell you what it was. And you can't remember the first concert either then, or, or can you? The first concert, yes, it was actually Oasis. Um, it was on one of their tours, one of their early tours. I went to see Oasis, and it's a funny story. Myself and my there's three friends, we went along, and we had um, seating tickets in one of these um, shows, and um, we were there fairly early. It was our first gig, well, late teens sort of thing. And um, these three girls and a, and a boy came up to us up the stairs and said, we've got standing tickets, do you want to swap? We don't fancy being in all that bit in the middle so of course we swapped tickets and we went down and we got crushed and enjoyed every second of it <laughs> <laughs> that reminds me of when i went to see rage against the machine oh, and we, we went to wembley arena and the whole of the floor was a mosh pit yeah and i felt like i lost lost a few stone in weight <laughs> in sweat being yeah. there, it was it's an incredible experience. There's nothing yes. like the live experience. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. And I did enjoy the live experience when I was when I was younger. Obviously, I did like to Glastonbury and and uh, Leeds Festival. Did that a few times as well, and Tea in the Park as well because I live up in Scotland. So I did that when I moved up here, but that's no longer with us anymore. But yeah, live music was was fantastic. But now I'm a father of four. I live in the Highlands of Scotland, so live music's not really a, an option that much for me. Well, you, you must get to some g good gigs at, you know, Glasgow and Edinburgh. They've got great venues. Yeah, absolutely. I was down at um, the, the David Coverdale's kind of last tour in, in May. Whitesnake was touring around. They had Foreigner in Europe on the bill with them as well. So I was down for that. And that was a, was a fantastic night. I mean, Joey Tempest, his voice from, from Europe, he's still got it. Absolutely yeah. brilliant voice. David, not so much, but we didn't expect much, to be honest with you. And I wasn't too surprised when he called off the rest of his uh, US tour due to his voice and things. But it was it was a great experience to, to be there and, and see him for what probably would be the last time. So that was nice. But in terms of Glasgow and Edinburgh, yeah, fantastic venues, fantastic concerts that happened there. But I'm three and a half, four hours north of that point. So <laughs> it's a bit of a journey to, to even get there. But I, I did go down recently as well for um, the Bouchard brothers. They were there. So they were former Blue Oyster Cult members. I went down and saw them play a really intimate gig at the, um, what's it called? The Hard Rock Cafe in Glasgow. That was really good. There was only a couple hundred people there, and that was quite fun. So, yeah, I get to the odd one or two, but not as many as I'd like. So the Bouchard Brothers, was that um, was that like a laid-back, stripped-back uh, performance of just, just them? It was it was the two of them and Joe's wife uh, who was playing guitar as well, and it was just it was just the three of them playing some Blue Oyster Cult hits, and uh, Joe's got a, a new album out, a solo album, so they could play a couple off there, some nice stories, and yeah, it was just a nice little intimate gathering. So yeah, it was, it was fun. 
there's something about when they perform songs in such a way where um, you know a song is really good when you can strip it back to yes. its bare bones and there's still something tangible there that that hooks you in. Yes, definitely. I mean, you think of bloistical songs. I mean, Don't Fear the Reaper is the obvious one, but you think of something like Godzilla, which is really big and bold and brash, and they still managed to pull that off with a couple of acoustic guitars. And I think my favorite bloistical song is Astronomy, which is a nice six, seven minute song, and it goes on for a long time. And that was really nicely done as well. So, yeah, exactly. I think when you when you strip anything back, and I used to have a radio show and I did an acoustic corner where I was, used to play out an acoustic version of a rock song, which was always nice and fun to do as well, because like you said, it just it brings out the melody. It brings out the the words as well and you get to feel more intimately what the song's about as well when it goes acoustically and you get the voice as well that you can enjoy to uh, a lot more than you do on record so yeah 100 percent agree with you in some ways i wish that the eagles would look back on their career there's a song particularly that i would like to hear that's stripped back i'd like to hear hotel california as just a single guitar and mm-hmm. don's voice because I think that would be incredible to listen to, just those two elements, yeah, because yeah. you've got everything there. Yeah, absolutely. Song. Absolutely. I'm sure it's probably on YouTube somewhere. <laughs> we, I'll be both of us after this call, just uh, getting on YouTube and looking for that. But uh, yeah, no, 100% agree. That was one of those songs as a teenager. I was in a band and we, we covered that. I had a fantastic guitarist who went on to be in a, a big band um, from where I was from. And they played Glastonbury and they were on Radio 1 and Steve Mac loved them and everything. And he used to do the, the solo to a T. I was the drummer. And yeah, that was one of the songs we used to cover. Nice memories, nice memories. Us drummers and bassists always get left behind. (laughs) Unfortunately, I went off to university. He carried on with another band and yeah, they made it and I didn't. (laughs) So have you got a favourite musician or band yourself? Oh, very difficult to pick one, isn't it? Let's be honest. Um, I would, I would, I'd, I'd say three. I'd say Rainbow. I love Rainbow. I absolutely love Rainbow in all its guises, whether it's Dio Bonnet or Joel Turn or even Doogie White. That one album that did Strangers and All. I love that, and I love Richie Blackmore. Um, I love Fleetwood Mac. Um, yep. Buckingham Nicks era Fleetwood Mac. I don't mind Peter Green, but uh, the Buckingham Nicks era Fleetwood Mac. I love that, and Led Zeppelin. Led Zeppelin are just insanely good. So <laughs> I'd have to, I'd have to have those three on a on a pedestal. But Richie Blackmore is as mad as a box is. <laughs> Absolutely. Him and Candice, what they're up to these days, playing their um, jousting music or whatever it is they do nowadays. It's always fun to watch their videos when they play together. He's, he's still fantastic on the guitar, don't get me wrong, but uh, yes. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, the musicality of what they're both up to is fantastic. Yes, definitely. Medieval sounds and things. And, and if you enjoy music, I think it is fantastic to listen to. If you go and put some of their videos on, they are they are really good. Um, guitar wise and everything else like that and I was going to say I, I'd interviewed uh, Pat Travers recently and they toured with Rainbow and he said that Richie was great although a little bit crazy at times <laughs> that's a that's an episode that's well worth listening to I've, I've not posted about that that's, that was on Monday nights listening by the way <laughs> there you go there that you episode go. but that Good blog's stuff. not gone out because as, <laughs> as a lot of people who listen to the show know probably I post blogs about what I listen to so yes that is in the latest blog that's not gone out yet. Oh, there we go. Something to look forward to. Yep. Pat Travers, guitar whiz. And his story of his his story of uh, his relationship with the uh, Ronnie Montrose was was incredible as well. Yes, absolutely. That's what we like to try and get under the, under the skin of when I, when I speak to people. It's not just a case of speak to me about your latest album or whatever it is. There is a bit of that, obviously, because that's kind of half of the release from the the PR people. They like you to speak about whatever's coming up new. But um, you like to find out something about them, whether it's a, a reason behind one of the big songs or a big album or a relationship they had with somebody. And yeah, like you said there, the, the Ronnie Montrose thing, where it started off on a rocky patch when he was headlining and Ronnie was like, who the F is this fella? <laughs> and then yep. um, obviously, it turned around they became good friends uh, later on which is always fantastic to hear oh there you go the big event that's the pat travers song the big event there you go yep yep check that one out and um, sh- shout out here i'll just say uh, a suggestion to people that i think that the first montrose album is a classic album yes yeah very good With indeed bad motor scooter and space station number five and amazing yep. 
Yeah, and Pat Travis said he, he he went on stage and performed Bad Motor Scooter a few times with with Montrose and everything like that. So yeah, fantastic stuff. Yeah, and um, yeah. So um, I was going to go somewhere else with that, and I, I forgot <laughs> completely where I was going to go. Hey there, this is Bobby with the Rock Guys podcast, and you are listening to Marv Smooth on the Pods Like Us podcast. Check him out. I mean, the podcast, though, it's it's not your first foray into it because you have a history in radio as well because that's another interesting one is sometimes you'll go into the archive of radio shows that you've mm-hmm. recorded as well with guests that you've had on those, which yeah. is also fascinating. Yeah, indeed. Um, so I started in radio about 20 years ago now, um, and I've literally done pretty much everything you can do in radio. I, I, I was a commercial producer, so I made all the adverts. I've written all the adverts. I've, I've won awards for writing adverts, things like that, creative of the year and stuff like that. I've been a, a sports reporter. I've been at football games at Hamden. I've done Scottish Cup finals. I've, I've done international matches. I've also um, been the presenter of a sports show, an, a four-hour all-speech sports show with no music, so I had to carry everything all the way through. Um, wow. I hosted an 80s show for more than a decade. And with that, I interviewed some incredible 80s artists, you know, your Rick Astley's and your Kim Wilde's and Paul Young's and Howard Jones and Nick Kershaw's. I've been to Rewind Festivals and interviewed them all backstage, Jason Donovan's and all that sort of stuff. You get to meet um, Spandau Ballet and all that sort of stuff. So, yeah, so I've done all that kind of thing as well. And it's been a fantastic career. And that's that career kind of took me where I am now in terms of what I do as a full-time living because I'm a, an audio producer. I make audio books and podcasts as well as doing my own podcast. I'm a, an audio engineer for my self-employed or for myself nowadays. Um, but in terms of the radio and the podcast, I did a podcast in 2013 because I had the the 80s show. So yep. it, it might still be out there somewhere. It's called The 80s Rewind Again. And it was myself and the breakfast show presenter at the time, Gino Conti. He was a... Um, his dad's Italian, his mum's Scottish, so he's, he's got the Italian name, but the very Scottish accent. And um, basically, we took all my interviews, and we had a bit of fun. And it was a lot of fun doing loads of different episodes. There's two big interviews on each episode. We'd come up with silly skits and all fun things. And like I said, we went to Rewind Festivals, and we, we documented that, and we ended up getting married i was the bridesmaid i had to put the bridesmaid's dress on he was the best man at some blow-up <laughs> wedding thing we did on the day and yeah it was an awful lot of fun so we did that back in 2013 2014 i think it was and then um just going through my career covid hit basically in 2020 and like yeah. an awful lot of other people i was made furloughed from the radio station i was working at, at the time and then kind of mid-summer I got bored of building tree houses for the kids and that sort of stuff and I turned an old decrepit summer house we had in the back garden into a little pub I think a lot of people were doing this at the time so I I decked it out I, I had um classic rock posters up on the wall got them I made a bar we called it the the vintage rock and roll bar and everything like that and it was again at that stage I thought I'm, I'm still not working I've got all this experience why don't i start my own podcast so i thought i was trying to think of what podcasts i could do i was thinking maybe do i resurrect the 80s one and then i thought no i've done that i've been there and then the whole idea for the the vintage rock podcast came around so vintage yeah. rock pod and it, it was a bit kind of off the cuff it was like oh yeah i'll just try that so I, i've got a few contacts obviously after a few years in radio i emailed a couple of people and the first three or four people that came back were all big names i mean john ilsley from dire straits rock and roll hall of famer Kenny Jones from Small Faces, Faces and the Who, Rock and Roll Hall of Famer. He came back and said yes. And I was like, oh, cranky, this is going quite well, actually. And Bruce Watson from Big Country, he was another one that said yep. yes quite quite quickly. And Colin Blundstone, lead singer of the Zombies, who'd just been inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And I was like, oh, crank, this is, this is moving quicker than I'd anticipated. So at this stage, I didn't have the professional recording equipment at home. I didn't have a studio. I didn't have anything. So I was literally recording on a a 50 pound mic in my little bar with no soundproofing. I had my old laptop. I had the inbuilt camera on my um, laptop, which was awful. And I thought, I'm just going to do it and see what happens. And it took off quite quickly. I was on BBC Radio Scotland with Kay Adams. She was interviewing me only a few weeks in. And I was in the Daily Record, which is a national newspaper in Scotland. I was in local newspapers. um, And there's some really fun articles and stuff about that. And my Scott's dad creates speaks to world famous rock stars in his shed and things like that. And it all kind of picked up really quickly. And I thought, oh, crikey. So I started chopping up some of the, the videos and putting them on YouTube. And they, they were awful. The quality wasn't great. And I thought, I'm going to have to do this properly. So 
Not too long after I'd launched the podcast, I was then made redundant. So obviously after quite a long time in radio, I got I got a fairly okay payout, which saw us for a few months. And I put some money into to doing it myself. That's why I set up as a self-employed audio engineer, making podcasts and audiobooks and that sort of thing, and built my own studio, which is where I'm sat now with a decent microphone and a processor and all that sort of stuff. And uh, luckily, it's kind of it carried on from there. It's kind of taken off. And yeah, it's it's a strange story, but it's 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 been good. It's been, it was good for me, especially in lockdown, to have something to focus on and something to put. I don't want to say talents because I don't want to make it sound like I'm talented. Some, my experience to to good use because I've done this for many years. So to be able to do it again for something new for myself was a fantastic release at what was a difficult time. Absolutely, uh, but I mean, you're like like you hinted at. I mean that you're one of many people because we we, yes. we found that when that when the lockdown came across the world, for the most part, there was this sudden surge in people making up podcast. Yeah. I mean, I'm one of those people that did that, but I wasn't furloughed because I I still went to work. I, I don't know how I fit. I still don't know how I fit the time around actually doing it around 70 <laughs> something hour a week, but Cracky. I still do it and I don't well, know how. You. But yeah, suddenly lots of people were making shows. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think it was a, a good creative way for people to express themselves. And and it's it's not as difficult. I mean, I, I look at some of the forums and things on Facebook and, and groups and things like that. And it's like, oh, I want to get into podcasting. I've got 500 pounds. How do I do it? And you're thinking you can literally get into to, to podcasting on a shoestring budget. You can talk to your phone if you want to. And with some clever editing techniques you can make it sound like you're in a studio anyway so it's not too difficult and it is nice for people to be able to express themselves and and use their creativity and use their time wisely to, to do something that they, they like as well and, to, and when you're talking about things that you enjoy it just makes you feel better and when you're speaking to people like we are now chatting about music it makes you feel good and there's nothing wrong with that at all and, and if one person listens to you and, and enjoys what you do then you've made that one person's life better and that's the way i always look at it Absolutely. And one of the other good things about it is that there are so many different uh, variations of podcast as well. So you'll have you'll have the big production pieces like the big audio dramas that are made by some studios. But yeah. then you get the, the person who's just basically doing an audio blog down to that level. And you've got all that and in, everything in between. And they're yes. all recorded in different ways. So you've got the intimate and then the flashy big shows like the big chat shows like the Joe Rogans yep. or the intimate, this person talks to just a normal person on the street about something. And that's the interesting thing because, I I mean, I've said to people before that, to my mind, whatever you're looking for, there will be something there. Oh, yeah. What, whatever, you know, whatever type of show you want, what you want the subject to be on. And that's the best thing about podcast is that you can get those niche audiences as well that you wouldn't get on a big radio station because a big radio station are after the numbers and not after the niche yeah yeah 100 percent. and again everybody's different i mean some people love joe rogan we were speaking just before we hit record and we were talking about people that love joe rogan and there clearly is lots and lots of people as he's number one across the world but i've never listened to a single episode of, of joe and that's no reason for, for someone not to listen to it or for someone to, to say they don't want to listen to it either it's just personal choice and some people like the intimate some people like listening to people talking in in their bedroom about something that a subject that they really enjoy as well and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that and again like you said there's wondery or there's the bbc that can come up with these fantastic dramas which uh, there's an awful lot of money spent making podcasts as well with some of these things as well so if you do enjoy that then absolutely and whether you want to listen to the nfl or an entrepreneurial podcast or your favorite a tv show or whatever it is there will be something out there and that's what's so good about podcasting there's no there's no barriers to it you can just do it hey this is brian with concerts that made us podcast and you're listening to pods like us a great show about other great shows so um we've got radio history podcast history so I mean, have, have you gone into detail of how you arrange it? Well, you've arranged the guests because you already had those um, connections from the radio days. So does yeah. that touch on the arranging guest, do you think, subject, or um, is there more yeah, to that? Yeah, I think so. I mean, 
there's lots of different ways it comes. I mean, obviously, I've, I've built up contacts with PR people and managers. Um, there's times when people reach out to me and say, so and so is doing this, that, and the other. Do you want to speak to them? There's times when, it, I mean, it goes dry. I mean, I, I was honest with my listeners a few weeks ago and said that, look, the interviews will probably be pretty quiet over the next few weeks because it is a very, very heavily touring time of year. I mean, everybody I was reaching out to was either just about to go on tour, currently on tour, or I've just come off tour and want a break. So it was like, oh, okay, that's not really helpful for me when I need to speak to people. But again, it's, it's the way of the world. So um, in terms of arranging guests, there's lots of different ways I reach out, they reach out. There's people that are on a, a register that just come round and I don't want to speak to you this time, I'll speak to you next time. Okay, cool. And then three months later, they pop back up and you're like, oh, we'll, we'll go now, we'll go now, that'd be good. So yeah, it's it's always good. And in terms of the people I speak to, I've spoke to Joan Lynn Turner, who's obviously in the news recently with his yeah. alopecia and things like that, the former Rainbow and Deep Purple lead singer. He was living with his wife, Maya, I think it was Ukraine or Russia. It was that kind of way. So you're talking that sort of time difference. I spoke to Andrew Farris, who was the main songwriter in NXS with Michael Hutchins and all that. He was over in Australia. So we're talking a completely different time zone. And then Dave Mason, who was in traffic and worked with Jimi Hendrix on All Along the Watchtower and everything like that. He was in Hawaii. So again, it was, I think it was 7 p.m. at night for him, 6 a.m. in the morning for me. So it's always fun trying to work out when I can interview some of these guests, especially some of the American ones. So um, yeah, the, the time arranging can be can be difficult, but you've got to be flexible. And I'm quite lucky to have my own recording studio. I don't have to go to a radio station or or hire out somewhere at four in the morning to try and get in there and, and set up and get ready. The funniest one that I've had would be uh, there's a show or, or there's this duo who make a show together called Xander and then there's Jenna Stone. So it's called Xander and Stone and whatever show they're doing. Uh, and Xander is actually based in Japan Right. Is it, is it Japan or China? One of those two. And Jenna Stone is in Arizona. Oh, crikey. So I've got, uh, so on that episode, but I don't know how they make it work for their own show because <laughs> of the time difference there. Yes. Yeah. It's incredible. And yes. for me, it was incredible as well because Arizona, you're going back to central time, which is six or mountain time, actually, which is like six yeah. hours behind. And then Japan, you're going, I think I was going 10 hours ahead. <laughs> so we were literally having different meals. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I mean, different days. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Different days. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> it's a strange world. It's, it's it funny. Certainly but is. The technology is there now to allow us to do that. Yes. And, and I speak to obviously a lot of rock stars these days that – all their albums are made kind of remotely. I mean, Pete Sears was on recently, Jefferson Airplane, Rod Stewart, that sort of thing. And he was saying his most recent album was, I record my part, pass on to him. He records his part, pass it back. And I put it into Pro Tools, send it out to some guy who was living in the middle of Death Valley or whatever it was. And he records his back, bit, sends it back to me. And then we put it together and send it off to the guy who masters it. And yeah, it's just kind of the way of the world now, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, a lot of people have done that. I mean, I've seen, uh, we, we mentioned, before, did we mention it before we started about Ringo Starr? Yes, All of yeah. his bits are done now remotely because of mm -hmm. the lockdown. And he's done a lot of guest spots actually as a drummer on people's albums recently, because he is at home with his drum kit in his own studio in his house. Yeah. He's and he's getting into anybody's getting in touch with him one saying to him, <laughs> Well, you know, we could do with, we, we could do with some drums on this. He's like, oh, I'll send it over, I'll do it. And then, you know, <laughs> suddenly on more records probably now yeah. than he, he has been in many years. Good on and it, it makes you laugh, doesn't it? When you think back to the, the 60s, was it with, with Lola came out and was it Ray Davis had to fly back from the States just to re-record that, the Coca-Cola to Cherry Cola line because the BBC wouldn't play it. Absolutely, yeah. Flights and everything else like that. But nowadays that'd take two seconds, wouldn't it, in a, a little studio somewhere? Well, yeah, or or in the or in a back bedroom somewhere or something yes, someone might do and just put, put some soundproofing Duvet in over your there. Head. Off you yeah. get <laughs> <laughs> oh dear me that's what richard james does from the uh from the from the jerry anderson podcast oh, he's actually okay. in, a, in a he's actually in a cupboard when Crack he records warm. <laughs> with, with yes it is very warm for, for about two hours with a quilt oh, around him to make it really really oh, quite de word. deathly quiet crikey well there you go I'm thankful for my little studio. <laughs> what, we, what we do for our art. Absolutely, absolutely. Yes, we sweat for your listeners, we sweat. <laughs> so 
we'll, we'll have to do this twofold, I suppose, because it, there's two different ways that we that your episodes are done. So okay. when you do um, interviews shows, are they structured in any way? Do you have a structure that you follow, or do you just let it flow and have bullet points instead that you'll occasionally hit? Um, I like to have questions prepared um because all depending on the guest i mean some guests are fantastic and you can't stop them speaking others you, you get a 30 second sound bite out of them and if you don't have anywhere to go from there you, you're in you're in trouble so i do like to have a, a set of questions for every everyone i speak to in terms of the structure it all depends on the pr person um some people like to have the new album mentioned first or the new tour or whatever it is they like to have that front and center so you you don't have much variation with that you have to go with that first and then you you kind of swivel it nicely back to the back to the the career of the 60s 70s or 80s in my case or whatever it is um but in terms of bullet points yeah you do pick up on whatever they say and you try and take it in nice different directions but um yeah like i said i do like to have set questions just in case and then you have a specific structure definitely for the uh, for the this day rocks episodes because you start with the celebrity birthdays and then you go into the main uh, topic yep. uh, or subject of the episode with a guest who is you is sometimes one of the members of the group or someone that was on there like the Dave Mason story of uh, of being on all along the watchtower was fantastic <laughs> and then you have fellow podcasters as well on yeah, exactly right. I mean, um, as well as it being a way of recycling and reusing old clips, and again, like you said, they're marketing old interviews that people may not have dipped back into. It was a way of reaching out to the podcast community as well, because I think that's the way that we all grow within ourselves, don't we? I mean, we, we reach out and we all guest on each each different people's podcasts sorry and it's just a nice way to, to to feature other people i mean i'm part of pantheon podcast network the vintage rock pod which is a network in america of music shows so i like to use some of the people on there just to if they can get an extra listener or two from my audience then that that's fantastic plus i get to have their expertise because there are people that specialize in bob dylan or aerosmith or whoever it is i mean today was was um dan from the paul weller fan podcast and he his knowledge and in-depth for well beyond what I could come up with. So I think it's nicer for my listener to hear from someone that knows an awful lot more about that that, that subject than I than I could ever possibly put to them. So it is nice that I do that. But in terms of the structure, yes, I think on something as short as that five minute thing, I do like the listener to know where it goes. It is a hello, this is what it is, birthdays, main topic, catch the rest of it here. I'll be back tomorrow. And I think when you tune in, you know exactly what you're going to get from it. And I think if you start messing around with it, it can get a bit weary, I think, at times. But, yeah, that's my personal opinion. And I've already added Dan's podcast to my subscriptions as well. There you go. See? He'll be pleased with that. (laughs) So the recording and editing of the shows then, I'm guessing it depends on what you're doing. So if it's the bits that you're on your own, that's essentially easier than doing the remote. I'm guessing that the, the chats with the guest are remote. Yes, that's right. Yeah. So in terms of this day rocks, um, because again, it's such a short thing. I'm looking for two or three minutes from the contributor because it's only a five minute kind of maximum show. What I will do is send them questions um, and then they'll send back their recordings and I'll then figure out a way of intro and outroing them depending on what they say. And we can drop that in, which is nice. And, and it works well for, for them as well, because they can fit that in around their own studio time or recording time. And the, I'm not trying to hook up with someone in Manhattan or I don't know, Melbourne, trying to find uh, two minutes that we can speak about a quick subject. So in terms of this day rocks, then definitely it's it's it's, it's a case of, of remote recording and getting them to do it themselves, which is a lot easier for all involved. So do you do that via Zoom then or, or something? And like you said, you get them to record their own sound or or do you re- or do you use the Zoom recording with the guests? And it depends who it is. I mean, when we're talking about rock stars, Getting them to hit them, the, put them their own video on at times can be difficult. Um, I, the, you know yourself. There's lots of different recording softwares out there. Zencaster we're using right now. There is Zoom, Riverside. There's Clean Feed. There's lots of other different things that we can use. Um, I tried various different ones with some of them and i'm talking to people who are in the 70s so i ended up sticking with zoom basically because everybody seemed to know what it is and most people are aware of it nowadays it became almost like the the staple 
pro, uh, program to use, didn't it? And I think everyone's used that from, I spoke to Dave Brock, who's in his 80s now, and he, he knows what Zoom was. So we went ahead with that. I tried um, Zencaster with um, Stephen Piercy from Rat, and he couldn't get it to work. He didn't know what he was doing. It never happened. We had to reschedule the day after and do it on Zoom anyway. So I kind yeah. of gave up with all these fancy things. But when it does come to um, podcasters and people that are a bit more tech savvy, and I don't mean that in a bad way, but people that are kind of around this sort of equipment all this time, all the time, then I do tend to use a Zencaster or a Clean Feed if the video is not essential because Clean Feed is fantastic quality, and I use that when recording voiceovers for different projects that I do as well. So um, in terms of remote recording, yes, there's, there's different things, but maybe mainly Zoom, only because of the people that I'm speaking to in terms of 70-plus you know, <laughs> rock stars that are happy to still be here and, and lucky I can get them to press play at some times. <laughs> yes, absolutely. So the um, I, I like the simplicity of the logo as well for the show, by mm -hmm. the way, and uh, the, the music for the show. Did you source that or is that your own music? It's not my own. It's it's a piece like many podcasters will know. You can you can pay a small sum of money and and claim the rights to, to a piece of music. I'm sure somebody else is using that music somewhere as well because it is there. It's it's available to buy. I didn't have it composed for me. It's just a just a track that I, I spent a little bit of money on. Like I said at the time when I when I started the podcast, it wasn't with any grand dreams of doing this that or the other. So it was quite oh, it sounds all right. That'll do. I'll, I'll I'll chuck twenty quid or whatever it was at the at the rights for that, so that'll do. Um, so that's that's where that one came from, and just with a little bit of editing, I managed to do the 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 swoosh that I use in and out of of interviews and things like that, which always sounds quite nice. That I use on the videos as well at times on YouTube. Um, and in terms of logo, that's something I just designed myself on on one of the um, computer programs that we have nowadays. It was quite simple. I, I like the black and red. It's just something I like. Um, so a very simple logo with the name, the VRP on there, and then the little slogan, my music is better than yours, which I came up with. So yeah, nice and easy. Hello, everybody. This is Ryan. And this is Avery. And we are from the Frame by Frame King Crimson podcast, and you are listening to Pods Like Us. So are there any episodes that to you, this, this is an awful question to ask somebody. <laughs> Because it, it's almost like you're trying to pick a favourite favorite child favorite in a child. way. Yes, yeah, yeah, I know so what you mean. Have you got any favourite episodes? For various reasons. I think the, the, funny, the funnest episode I've done was episode 22, Greg Kin. And I often find this, some of the, some of the names that are not as big and known can be some of the best interviews. I mean, Greg Kin um, had a couple of hits in America, Jeopardy, uh, Breakup Song, that sort of thing. Had a long career. He was a breakfast show presenter as well on, on radio over in San Francisco, I, I believe, that kind of area. Um, but he was hilarious. The whole whole interview, he had me he had me in hysterics with some of the things he was saying. That's episode 22. So that was probably the funniest one. Um, in terms of someone that shocked me a lot, I'd interviewed him before. Uh, back in the 80s days, John Parr, everyone knows him from St. Elmo's Fire and things yeah. like that. But his his life is is a bit crazy. I mean, he, he got himself into six figures worth of debt in a 19-year court case that, that basically stopped his career at the height of his fame in the 80s. It kind of stopped. He went to court. And then as soon as anyone comes to you with a record contract, as he, he said himself, there's a little box there you tick if you're in litigation. And that ruled out everybody. So he kind of had to stop working. And his wife kind of brought the money in and they got into a lot of debt. Thankfully, they won the court case and they managed to pay all the debts off. But he says he got himself into an awful lot of debt. But at the same time, he was there for his kids and both of his kids became world champion in martial arts. He won Crufts yep. with his dog. Um, so it's an incredible story. And again, he's worked with so many greats. He wrote a song for Roger Daltrey about um, when Keith Moon died under a raging moon, which is very famous. And yes. yeah, it's a brilliant song. And he's worked with Meatloaf, basically discovered him and he lived in Meatloaf's house at the start of his career. So he's got all these incredible stories. So that's episode 15. That's one of the best. And um, again, for different reasons, Fee, Fee Waybill from the Tubes, he's just crazy. Um, bondage, nudity on stage. He goes through all that sort of stuff. Jolyn Turner, I said I was a big fan of Rainbow Jolyn. He's been in the, the news recently as well. He went deep into some things from his childhood and spoke a lot about Richie Blackmore and Deep Purple and some of the crazy things that he went through. I mean, that was fantastic. Jackie Fox, again, from The Runaways. I mean, an all-girl group. Um, she went really deep. She talked about the sexual assault and being raped and things like that. So that was quite heavy. And when you think of those girls were just teenagers when they when they made it big. And yeah. so, yeah, as well as your, your big names, you've got these sorts of people that are, are telling fantastic stories as well. So I don't know. I don't think that's one, but that's, there's a few there for you to, to, to go back and listen to at least anyway. Absolutely. 
So, you know, I'm going to throw out a curveball here. Go for it, yeah, yeah. Have you got five albums that are absolutely the albums that you will go to the most to listen to? Yes, yeah, 100%. I mean, they kind of follow along the lines of my favourite bands, I think, in a way. Led Zeppelin 2 um, is my favourite Led Zeppelin album. I know there's loads of discussion about who, what, where, why, when, uh, when it comes to Led Zeppelin albums, and Led Zeppelin 4 is usually held up as the one. But for me, Led Zeppelin 2 is just... I love it. It's the pinnacle of Zeppelin for me. Um, Fleetwood Max Tango in the Night. That's controversial again because Rumours is the one that usually gets held up, but I, I love the 80s sound on that and some of the songs that are not the big hits. Isn't it Midnight, Caroline, Other Side of the World, that sort of stuff. I love that era, Fleetwood Mac. Uh, Rainbow, the first Rainbow album for me is is the best one. I love that. Um, Grunge, Pearl Jam's 10, I think is one of the greatest albums of all time. I love that album. Um and again, it's one of those that gets played constantly. And I'm going to throw in a compilation album. And it's one of these albums that my stepdad got me into, um, which is probably where my love of the likes of White Snake and Deep Purple and Rainbow came from. It was called Purple Rainbows. And it was basically the, the Deep Purple Rainbow family. And it was all the different people that were involved in the bands and the offshoots from it. And as well as having, I don't know, Black Knight on there and, you had um, since you've been gone on there from from Rainbow and things like that. You've got people like Graham Bonnet, so some of his solo hits, and you had some of Dio's stuff on there, and Coverdale's stuff on there, and some Gillen tracks on there, and that's that's one of those that stuck with me forever. And I love the fact that everything was kind of condensed onto there from the whole Rainbow family. So if anyone ever gets the chance to check out that, it's called Purple Rainbow. It's a lovely compilation record. That if uh, I don't know if it's still available. I don't know if you can stream it, if you can buy it, but that was one that I listened to a lot in my teenage years. I absolutely loved it. I don't know about you, but that reminds me of, um, I have this um, fascination with, um, I can't remember who started it off, but what they call rock family trees. Oh, where yeah, you get yeah. these things where it starts with one specific band and then it will f- filter down and you'll have two bands or three bands that come from that and then suddenly yeah. you have this, that, and the other. And it, it's it's fascinating to see because you'll suddenly see like, oh, Ian Gillen, you know, he's, he's left Deep Purple and then he's got his own career and then, and then oh, that's a bit weird. He's done an album with Black Sabbath and then he's gone back to Deep Purple <laughs> and then all this, that, and the other. And then you've got Glenn Hughes, you know, yep. who took over Roger when when Roger and Richie left and started Rainbow. He had Glenn Hughes and David Coverdale, as you said. Yep. And then David Coverdale went off to go and do, you know, White, White Snake. Snake. Yeah. And then Glenn went off to do what he did. And there was no Deep Purple for a while. And then they came back. But for some strange reason, they came back with Joe Lynn Turner on lead vocal, who was with <laughs> Rainbow. And yes, it's, yep. it's a fascinating and interesting thing to look at yeah i mean it is incestuous is the wrong word but it is is very much like that isn't it a lot of bands have similar members who move between them all the time and we spoke of graham bonnet and then obviously the graham bonnet band and alcatraz and and doogie white who was with rainbow then i think he's the lead singer of alcatraz now as well it's it's very bizarre how these kind of things go round in circles and um and when you're interviewing these different guests as i do you, you speak to someone like carmine apiece who's been a drummer with some incredible bands, Vanilla Fudge and Cactus and Jeff Beck and all these sorts of bands. And he mentions somebody he's worked with. And then I speak with Pete Sears, who worked with um, Jefferson Starship. And then he mentions somebody that Carmine worked with. And you're like, oh, how does that even come together? And then I think Pete mentioned um, somebody from Lindisfarne. And I've interviewed Ray Laidlaw from Lindisfarne. And you think, oh, right, how, how does that get to, to folk like Lindisfarne is? And then, do you know what I mean? How they all kind of, they, they weave in and out of each other and they all intersect. And I know it's um it's it's an industry, so they all kind of know each other roundabout ways. They all play festivals, concerts, TV shows. So they probably meet and bump into each other that way. But it's so interesting, I find, when you hear one person mention somebody and somebody else mention somebody. And you've just spoken, like you said, to I spoke to Tony Martin, who was lead singer of Black Sabbath for a long period as well. In fact, second longest lead singer of Black Sabbath after Ozzy. And he mentioned yeah. somebody he worked with. And you're thinking, well, that, that guy's over here doing prog. And you're thinking, how does that? <laughs> and it's just, it's fascinating yeah. the way that it is yeah. kind of all mixed and weaved. And like you said, the family trees are fascinating. I, I, I find them just wonderful yeah i mean uh, i'll I'll go to something else in a second uh, along a similar line but that makes me think of when i got the innuendo album by queen 
Okay. And yeah, then yeah. you listen and you think, and then you look at the credits and you think, Steve Howe is on Innuendo <laughs> doing guitar. Yeah. yeah. How did that happen? You know, you've got yeah. Steve Howe from the big, one of the biggest, most well-known prog bands suddenly, you know, who's the guitarist suddenly is on a Queen song and they're doing <laughs> dual guitars, him and Brian May together in, so you get, you, you get these weird things where people will suddenly appear on other people's records. Yeah, yeah, and quite famous. I, mean, I spoke to uh, Steve Lukather from Toto, and famously he provided all the, the real guitar parts for the Thriller album, Michael Jackson, one of the biggest albums of all time, of course. And a lot of people think Eddie Van Halen did all the, the guitar on Beat It, but he, Eddie only provided the solo, so it was basically Steve Lukather did all that. And then when I spoke to Mark Stein, who was the lead singer with Vanilla Fudge, he worked with Dave Mason, who we've already mentioned, who'd worked with Traffic and Steve Winwood, and who'd worked with Jimi Hendrix. And so Mark Stein, the lead singer of Vanilla Fudge, worked with Dave Mason and they pulled Michael Jackson in because they were working in opposite studios. So they pulled him in and got him to sing on one of Dave Mason's tracks. So vocalists yes. are Dave Mason, Michael Jackson, and Mark Stein. And you're thinking, how on earth do these three people come together to produce a record? And it's like, it is, it's fascinating. I, I love it. I genuinely love it. And that's why I like to uncover on these these interviews because you, you you do uncover people like that and you go, wow, how are you speaking to him and working with him? And it's completely opposite to what you'd expect. I'm about to tell you what the Dave Mason song is called. <laughs> Come on, Martin. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Dave Drum roll, please. <laughs> it's uh, Save Me from the That's album the one. Old, Crest, Old Crest on a New Wave. There you go. That's it. <laughs> that right is the there. one. <laughs> That's the album. But um, I was going to say, I mean, that, that same thing that you said where suddenly you'll think, how did that happen? So Glenn Hughes, before Deep Purple, was in a band was, was uh, the main lead vocalist and bass player of a band called Trapeze. And there's an interesting one because then, so many years down the line, the guitarist for White Snake is the guitar same person that was the guitarist for Trapeze <laughs> all those many years ago, Mel Galley. Ah, oh, there you go. Let's be honest, there's been about 400 guitarists in White Snake over the years, so someone's bound to get there in the end, aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, here, I'm here if you need me, by the way. No. Yes, yeah. <laughs> yes. If you need A minor into C into G, I can manage that. Yeah. <laughs> <sighs> oh, Hello to all of you boys next door, mums and dads, new weds and nearly deads, introducing Dangerous Amusements, a brand new podcast where we talk about the music of Elvis Costello. I'm Stu Arrowsmith, and in each episode I'll be joined by a special guest to chat all things Elvis, and I'll be asking them to help me compile the ultimate Elvis Costello playlist. So what advice would you give to people if they wanted to start a podcast? Um, I would say figure out what you want from it first before you start. Yeah. Um, if you want to do it as a throwaway hobby or if you want to do it seriously and try and gain traction and try and make money off it. I mean, at the end of the day, a lot of people make money on podcasts. If you want to do that, then that's two very different ways you need to approach it. Um, if you want to do it for off your off your own back to just to ex express yourself, to be a bit creative, to do something a bit different, to do something that you want to talk about, then just go for it. Absolutely, just go for it. You don't need the the world's biggest equipment. You don't need to spend a fortune on it. You just need to have the expertise in terms of your topic. One thing I do hate is people that ramble that just yeah. talk about nothing when you you listen to, I don't know, whatever it was, a Star Trek topic, and they're talking about what they've got up to in the shop for the, for the first five minutes of the episode, and you're like, no, no, <laughs> I want to listen to Star Trek here. Um, so, yeah, so if, if you want to do it on your own back, then absolutely just go for it. If you want to do it seriously and you want to make some money off it, then make sure you've got everything in place first. Make sure you've got a marketing strategy or at least get the socials in place because the amount of podcasters that have got completely different social handles everywhere you go, you could be on yeah. Facebook and it's at, 
cheese makers are us you go to twitter and it's we love cheese and then on instagram it's cheese is best and you're like that, that's that's not going to help you in any way shape or form not that it's the be all and end all but just some sort of cohesive marketing strategy make sure you know who you're aiming at if it is cheese then you're not going to aim that at vegans or people that don't like cheese um make sure you've got some sort of clear um audience in mind now my audience obviously i'm 60s 70s 80s rock music so my audience are predominantly and this isn't judging but it's 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 over 50 males i look at the the audience breakdown on my uh, podcast stats and it is 72 percent. i think recently was over 50 males is is the demographic on my youtube the last 28 days it is 99 percent over 50 males so that shows you where my targeting needs to be so there's no point in me coming in and talking about i don't know the new band of the moment because over 50s might not be that interested in the new band of the moment so i have to be quite um careful with who i choose when i speak to they have to be well-known or at least have been associated with somebody well-known from somebody that's going to appeal to the over 50s market so make sure that you've got your marketing strategy in place make sure you've got a defined audience um and plan it out as well there's no point in making one episode and putting it out make sure you've got at least five or six episodes or a plan for five or six episodes before you even launch because a lot of people will tell you this as well i'm sure that make sure consistency is the key so i Again, this is my personal structure. It's different to everybody else's. Every Monday, I release the big interview. So if I don't have a big interview in place, then I'll make sure I've got some sort of big episode. So it's I have um, classic rock stories where, again, I find loads of nice little snippets of maybe seven or eight different previous interviews. And I, I, I use that or I've spoke to, if I've interviewed somebody in the past, then what I'll call the second time I speak to them, I speak to them, I call it a side two. So it's almost like you, you flip the disc over and you flip the record over and you get to, to listen to something else, something we're up to nowadays, something we didn't touch on the first interview. So yeah, so on a Monday, it's always a big interview session or a big episode. It's, and when I say big, it's not your Joe Rogan big. It's usually a half an hour, half an hour to 45 minutes sort of thing. And then for the rest of the week, I do a Tuesday to Sunday. It's a five minute this day rocks as we've touched on. So make sure that you, you've got some sort of plan in place for your first five, six episodes so that you're not just launching one. Two weeks later, you're coming back with another. A day after that, you're putting another one out. Then you've got to wait three weeks. You've got to make sure that the listener knows exactly what they're going to get and when they're going to get it. So they, all my listeners know that obviously everyone's different. A lot of people only listen to the five minute episodes. A lot of people only listen to the big interview shows. So they all know what day they can get um their episodes that they really like and that, that interests them so make sure your marketing strategy is in place make sure you've got a clear defined audience and make sure you've got a good plan in place for the first run of episodes and and just go for it just just have fun enjoy it so that that brings actually you know i'm going to i'm going to tan- go on a tangent here i'm going to say so how far ahead are you when you are when you when you recorded episodes, how far ahead are you when you <laughs> record them? Are you like a week or two away, or have you have you got a bulk already available in the background? Like, I mean, the five minute episodes, the this, this day rocks. Do you do them all in one clump? I, I would love to sit here and tell you that I've got two months worth of shows all tucked away, all uploaded, all scheduled, ready to go. Um, but unfortunately, life doesn't work that way. If this was a full time job, um, then I would absolutely be doing that. Um, in terms of the interviews, I tend to work two to three weeks in advance. So I've already got a couple of interviews in the bag that I have not released yet. And we spoke about one that I'm interviewing tomorrow, which is a big name, big, big name. Um, I'm looking forward to doing yeah. so. That's that's kind of how far I work in advance in terms of the five uh, the five minute episodes this day rocks I tend to work a few days in advance because they don't take an awful lot of time to put together um a lot of them are just clips from previous episodes um others are clips that are taken from other podcasters or journalists as we said and they're sent to me so they only take maybe half an hour to put that show together so I tend to work a few days in advance when it comes to that um it has been known that I've scrambled something together on the day or depending on life I mean let's be honest life does get in the way I have four children I have a I have a job that I have to try and do to keep um, the the food on the table so the podcast sometimes does have to take a back seat but I still still try and hit those daily podcasts and I don't think I've missed one <laughs> after um after I came back from my summer break. So, yeah. Oh, and that's another little tip as well. Do not suffer burnout. 
Podcast yep. burnout is a real thing. It is not as easy as everyone makes out, and the pressure can get a little bit at times um, yeah. to try and hit the schedule, to try and make sure you've got something every time. So I always schedule about a month to six weeks in the summer where I do nothing. I literally barely post on social media. I tell everybody I'll see you again after summer. And again, over Christmas as well, I'll probably wrap up a couple of weeks before Christmas and then launch again at the end of January. It's just because you do need periods where you can just sit back and not chase people and not looking for interviews and not, because that's another thing, researching interviews can take an awful long time. <laughs> so it, it is it is very time consuming and then there's the editing and then there's the, everything else that gets involved with it. And again, with this day, day rocks, although it only takes a, a short amount of time to put together, you do have to research every single day. You have to find a different story every day. You have to find everyone's birthday. You have to find somebody that you can speak to about it every day. So there is an awful lot of work that goes on behind the scenes. It is, it's, it's like a full-time job <laughs> trying to keep this podcast going. And I'm sure you speak to many other podcasters that will tell you exactly the same thing. It's it's not a, a hit, start, record, hit, stop, upload, and gone. Because there's show notes, there's the social media aspect, there's the marketing side of it all. There's an awful lot that goes into trying keeping this this thing afloat that that we do for the love of the game that's why i say anyway the love of rock music that keeps me going i like the fact that i'm talking to a professional that knows what he's talking about here so that he can <laughs> pick, pick me up on something that i missed so what sort of research do you do then leading up to, i mean that's that's different for each as well so when you do the interviews yeah. that'll be a different type of research to the research that you do for the this day rocks episodes yeah yeah, absolutely. I mean, the interviews, um, obviously, some of them are huge names. I'm a big fan. I'll know an awful lot about it already, but I'll hold my hands up. There's some that I've interviewed. I'd, I've, I couldn't have told you a song before <laughs> before I started researching them sort of thing. Um, and it's because I'm not that niche when it comes to the rock music. I, I classify my vintage rock as anything from the 60s, 70s and 80s that has guitars basically in it. So we do go from the folk side of things, like I said, mentioned earlier, Blindisfarne, um strobes that sort of thing right through to some of the really heavy stuff uriah heap and and deep purple and alcatraz and black sabbath i've interviewed them uh, people from that band sorry and again genesis and marillion and jethro toll ian anderson lead singer you know, that's a bit of the proggy side of it also and um, you do have to make sure you, you know an awful lot about the band um again like i said I, I know a lot about most of the bands some of the bands i have to look back into and um, i like to watch old interviews with them as well and that gives me yeah. a feel of what they're like as people Um you can get the feel of how you think they will interact to certain questions how you ask certain questions how you speak to them um some of them can be jovial some can be quite short sharp 30 second answers so you kind of have a bit of an inkling as to what you're going to get from each artist before you speak to them by by listening and watching um old interviews of them and sometimes you can find out some interesting things that someone else has uncovered and you you found a youtube video that's got like 100 views on it or something you find out some really interesting detail that they've never shared before and they say that and you think oh i'm gonna dig that out then and make it sound like i found this um so yeah there's there's, there's lots of different ways and but like i said i think the best way of doing it is listening to and watching old interviews when it comes to something like this just so you get the gist of the person you're interviewing because that makes a big difference on how you approach them and how you can speak to them as well but also at the same time i mean you obviously do an incredible deep dive into them because you'll go as far back with some of them, you'll mention bands that nobody that's a normal fan or just <laughs> somebody that listens to their music would even know about, you know, I mean, you know, it's a bit like if you ended up interviewing um, Dave Coverdale, yeah. how many people would know without researching that Dave Coverdale used to be in a band where the guitarist was Chris Rear? Yes, exactly, exactly. You know. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, you, you have to know your subject. I mean, any interview will tell you that. If, if you don't know the person you're going to speak to or anything about them, then you can just end up in a, a minefield of problems. I mean, I did once upon a time, 20 years ago, when I started interviewing people, I asked a really stupid question of somebody. And I asked why uh, the pop band um, disbanded, why they, why they decided to call it a quits. And it turned out that the lead singer had, had died. And at that right. point, I realized, oh my God. And again, I was I was early 20s at that point, And I, that was a, a lesson learned, harsh lesson learned to do your research properly, Paul. Um, <laughs> so yeah, you make sure that you, you do dig back. And, and by digging back, you can uncover some really 
really interesting things, like you said there, David Coverdale and Chris Rea. And by mentioning yeah. something that not many people do, it sends the artist down a different rabbit hole and it, it opens them up as well because they expect certain questions. They expect to be asked about that number one hit or that number one album. Whereas if you ask something slightly different or take them down a different avenue, then they open up and that leads them to something that they don't often talk about. Again, going back to my 80s days, I was told, Point blank, when I interviewed Shaken Stevens, I couldn't ask him about his Christmas song because he was sick of talking about it. So in the middle of the interview, this was in November, I didn't mention the song, but I said to him, so what's a, what's a Shaken Stevens Christmas then? What do you do at Christmas? And that got him on to <laughs> talking about his song. He naturally drifted onto it himself. So I, I, when it came to the, the manager listening to it, I, they said nothing because I didn't bring it up. He did. So by yep. talking about something else completely, it can sometimes bring you to the place you want to be without doing it directly, if that makes sense. But at the same time, when you go into those earlier bands that they these people have been in and whatever, sometimes you'll, you'll catch uh, like – it's almost like lightning in a bottle in a sense where you're suddenly the nostalgia kicks into these people because after all, these people are humans just like the rest of us, you know, they're not super humans like us. So occasionally you'll hit, you'll hit this thing where they'll suddenly get all nostalgic and you'll see this big smile appear or this sudden change of how they are and they'll, <laughs> they'll become happier. And you, you've hit that space where yeah. no other interviewer will probably go there and you've suddenly put them into that place where it's like – and in a, in a sense, you're hitting a subject that – because no, no, not many people approach these things so much – it's interesting to them because they're used to yes, the same yeah. old, same old questions yeah. all the time. And if you ask them something different, yeah, it makes it more interesting to them as a person. Yeah, hundred percent. Like I said, rather than asking them about the number one hit, like everybody does or whatever it is, you, you speak about something else, which makes them open up a little bit first, and sometimes brings them onto that number one hit without you having to mention it. And when and when it comes through naturally like that or organically like that, they are more inclined to, like you say, open up and 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 speak more freely, and and it just makes for a, a cleaner and a nicer interview, doesn't it? Rather than hi, Johnny, your number one was this. And it's like, yes, my number one was that. And and like you said, by speaking about something else, it does open them up and it makes them feel like, oh, this guy knows what he's talking about. And that's that's something I pride myself in as well. I mean, I don't play out very often, but on the end of interviews, I mean, Simon Kirk from Free and Bad Company said he, he... praised me on my interview skills and everything and i've got a little clip saved away and and the pat travers one on the end of the interview says we need to do this again i really enjoyed it again with car minor piece there's lots of people that do that so it's it's a nice pat on my own back to say look i've done something right when they're telling me that they have enjoyed the interview themselves and they want to do it again so that's that's always nice as an interviewer to hear absolutely so what podcast do you actually like listening to um, myself, uh, as a football fan, uh, there's one called the Anfield Rap that I listen to as a Liverpool fan. Um, and I love the whole story behind that, how they just started as a couple of fans that were talking about football club and they've, they've basically grown into an army. Of, I think there's 13 full-time members of staff and videos and they get used by Sky Sports and they're phoned up by the BBC and all the, the nationals and internationals every time there's a big game on. And I think it's fantastic the way they've, they've grown that podcast from from nothing, basically. It's, it's, a, it's a wonderful story. Um, I do like my history podcasts. I like um, Noise. I do one called Short History Of. Um, Paul McGann used to, to, to narrate that one, which I loved, but he no longer does. I don't know what happened there, but still very good episodes. Um, all the history hit stuff, Dan Snow's podcasts, Warfare yeah. ones I got into recently as well. Um, I like some, obviously I do classic rock myself, so I don't listen to an awful lot, but there are a few that I do. Ugly American Werewolf in London, Magby yeah. and Action Jackson, they they're, they're always good to listen to. Joe Kay as well. He does one called Play That Rock and Roll where he dives in in deep. And obviously I've got to mention Pantheon Podcasts. I'm part of their network. They have some fantastic podcasts on there, some huge ones. Um, Who Cares About the Rock Hall is a really good one with Joe Kozala. Um, and yeah, it's, it's kind of varied. But but history, I'd probably say, is, is, is probably the main topic that I, I listen to. That's great. So where can people find your show and get hold of you? Find my show again on all usual podcast platforms um, or by going to vintagerockpod.com. You just search for Vintage Rock Pod. And you stick that into Google and you'll find pretty much everything, as I was speaking about earlier with all the social media handles. If you go onto Facebook or Twitter or Instagram, it's at Vintage Rock Pod or slash Vintage Rock Pod or whatever it is. It's all the same thing. 
Um, YouTube as well, I'm really trying to grow that. I've had some big video views on there. Well, relatively big for me, like 50,000, 20,000 sort of views on on some of the little clips of interviews on there. Again, just look for youtube.com slash vintage rock pod. Hit subscribe. I'm nearly at that kind of thousand subscribers mark um, so I can start monetizing it, which would be nice. Um, but again, it wasn't something I, I placed an awful lot of energy into for, for a long time, that one. It was podcasts because of my background in radio is all all audio is all putting together nice podcasts and putting them out regularly and i kind of forgot about youtube and i put one out every now and again and then every now and again one of them would get a bit of traction like five thousand views on it and i'm thinking oh crikey that's that's not actually too bad so then i have a little spate of putting some videos on there and they get nicely viewed so i'm trying to make a bit more of an effort with youtube um because it's it's a separate market completely i don't think it's the same audience People that consume YouTube is very different to people that consume podcasts. Um, so you've got to cater to everybody. And hopefully people are enjoying the things on video as much as as, as podcasts. And you get to see my ugly mug occasionally as well on the, on the videos as well. And again, it's, it's different. I put out some short one minute ones, some full length half an hour ones as well, all different sort of things, whether it's top fives, whether it's the artist's uh, choice one, like I spoke about earlier, I ask people one song from their own back catalog or their favorite song of their own. And I put them out or I put out little rock stories again, as I mentioned, and and full length interviews. And sometimes I leave things out of the, the podcast uh, specifically so i can use it as a youtube video as well so it's all there so just search for vintage rock pod everywhere basically and you'll see see my ugly mug and my my circle logo that's great thank you very much for that you can find pods like us just by looking up pods like us on twitter instagram and tiktok just the same as paul it's just it's the same thing everywhere pods like us on all these yes. places and you can contact me through pods like us at gmail.com anyway thanks for speaking with me today paul oh it's been an absolute pleasure thank you for having me on your show it's nice to nice to to, to chat to, to, to a fellow music fan who knows what he's talking about and although it's a bit weird answering questions rather than asking them like being on this side of it all i hope i didn't ramble too much well, I think we both like a good ramble now and then. <laughs> Nothing wrong with a ramble. <laughs> Nothing wrong with a ramble on from Led Zeppelin either. Exactly, yes, yes. I was on Led Zeppelin too as well, wasn't it? I think. <laughs> That's a bad pun. I think it was. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, thank you everyone for listening and hope you listen again to another episode of Pods Like Us.